I had a brother who died of aplastic anemia when he was eight, and I was only nine at the time. And uh, there was nothing I could do to help him or help my family through it, and I was so frustrated by that, that that frustration sat with me as I grew up, and when I was able to help other families and other kids uh, in similar situations that I all too well knew about, um, I just made the most of it. Yeah, but it's interesting, though. I'm wondering, did the experience, the opportunity to help other children find you, or did you find that opportunity? It sounds like there was some symmetry to this, that it almost like it found you. It, yes, it did, really. It was actually a, <clears throat> all because of a little boy called Sean, who I was visiting, and I was visiting a children's hospital, and he was one of the kids that was there, and I got on so well with him, and he was uh, very ill with a brain tumor, and I kept in touch with him and his family. Uh, and they told me that he didn't have very long to live, but he, he, always, he always said he wanted to go to Disneyland. So by this time I was living in Los Angeles, so I flew him and his mother out. And it was the most extraordinary thing because what was very simple for me to do meant so much to him and so much to his mother. You know, she was, to look at her face was extraordinary because mm. she was looking at him having a good time which she hadn't seen that for such a long time. So that began this realization that if you could put it all together, maybe other children could have the same thing, huh? Yes. Because one person can't do it all, that's for sure. Right, and, and thank goodness we have a most marvelous group of volunteers who are right across the country, and now, of course, in Canada and the United Kingdom and Australia, we have chapters. There's a, there's a wonderful chapter here in Boston, which you've been very, very good to and, and helped out tremendously, which we thank you. Oh, for. you're welcome. I think anyone who has a child knows that that's a great place to put your efforts because you know that uh, it's very hard to see a child's dreams cut off at such an early age, and it's, uh, if you can do something, it's great. You know, in reading about you, it sounds as if you were almost born a professional, <laughs> that you had this un unbelievable desire to perform, like at first in dance. Right? Yes, yes, I, I'm told I started dancing at two and a half. I believe it. <laughs> I didn't know you could walk properly at two and a half, but uh, um, I started studying ballet because my mother was a ballet dancer, and I was at the Royal Ballet School for six years, which was very exciting. But that was cut off and pretty devastating, wasn't it, to you? Yeah, I had an injury, and I had to stop dancing, and it was all very melodramatic. It was like a scene from General Hospital, actually. <laughs> You'll never dance again. <laughs> um, but, but it was tough for you. It was tough. It turned out, of course, to be a blessing in disguise, because I thought, oh, gosh, what am I going to do? Oh, well, I guess I'll be an actress. But actually, you tried modeling <clears throat> first and said that that was more dependent on the God's gifts than, than your brains. I hated modeling. Did you? <laughs> hated it. I mean, it was really uh, nothing to do with me. My success was based on, you know, my, my parents' genes and, and uh, my orthodontist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got out of it. Yes. And, and actually had a pretty fair amount of success quickly, didn't you? I was... V I have been extremely lucky as an actress. Um, the first job that I auditioned for was the female lead in a movie, and I got the part. Now I was 17. Isn't that amazing? But I learned, after that, I learned what it's about. You know, I did my stint as a waitress. Yeah, you had that, to do that. That's mandatory, that. I think, for actors. It keeps your it? humility. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> toad, who, you are, so now you're doing Holly Scorpio in General Hospital, and the Shapiros, who are the creators, see you and fall totally in love with you, the creators of Dynasty. And also, another uh, supporter of mine, which I didn't know at the time, was Erin Spelling's daughter, who used to watch General Hospital and would say, Dad, <laughs> Isn't that look, great? she's really good. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden it happened. Huh? Was it yeah. tough, though, to replace an actress that the country knew in Pamela Sue Martin and walk into a new part? Yes, but I was, thank goodness, blessed with the experience from General Hospital. And uh, General Hospital, I was replacing, in some ways, Jeannie Francis, who played Laura, in, in as much as I was the new love interest for Luke. That's true. And... Um, I didn't realize at the time, because I hadn't watched the show, what a difficult job that was going to be in. And when I'd been on the show for about a month, I started getting letters from people saying, we thought we were going to hate you, but actually, we, we think you're very good. So then I realized that I could, it could have been very difficult for me. But the fans really did love you. They actually changed Holly's demise at the end. They yes. had to write you out, but they, the fans hated the way that happened. Yes, it was, it was interesting. They wrote me out in, in, first of all, I moved to Australia. And I was alive for a while, and there'd be lots of sort of one-way phone calls from Scorpio. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then they decided that they would have to kill me off, but kill me off in a bad way, make me look bad so that he could get romantically involved with somebody else. So they in intimated that I was having an affair when I died, that I was on a plane going to see my lover. And the audience, even though it was two years since I left the show, went, she wouldn't. <laughs> she wouldn't have done that. And the, and the producers got all this mail saying, what are you 
doing? Isn't that great? And so they had to change it. They found a letter that she had written declaring her love for her you husband. You must have loved watching that. I mean, just as a, as a human being and, a, and, and someone who's interested, I mean, it's got to be great fun to see how that all evolves. It was so nice to know that the audience support and that they knew this character so well that in three and a half years I'd been able to make her that defined that the audience was up in arms if she wasn't suitably respected. It was wonderful. It felt very good. Uh, your family, watching your success now, I, first of all, it's your, your career is almost a family affair. Your sister mm -hmm. manages the fan club, and Peter Samuelson is a cousin, He's right? my cousin, and he's my manager, yes. And, and, you give him and a his lot wife is my business manager. That's <laughs> right. You give him a lot of credit, don't you, yes. for your career? Yes, absolutely. He, um, he doesn't manage anybody else. He isn't actually a manager. By profession, he's a, a businessman and a film producer. And when I first came to Los Angeles, he was uh, helping me out, and I would say to people, well, you should talk to my cousin, and that sounded sort of amateurish, so I started referring to him as my manager. And he was really doing so much work for me, eventually I said, I have to pay you. <laughs> so now he's officially my manager. Isn't that yeah. great? The, the experience of Dynasty, I know you say that the experience of General Hospital was one of the best in your career, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the temperaments of everyone. And, but how about Dynasty? It's a different, it's a different ball game, isn't it, from daytime? It's, it's less work for more money. <laughs> That's nice. Um, which is great. Um, nothing will equal my experience on General Hospital. It was just magical. The, the, the character that I got to play was so super. Uh, the people that I worked with were great. As they also were on Dynasty. But um, I was there for uh, four years. And it wasn't until the last year on Dynasty that I really felt that the character was, was what I wanted it to be. Mm. And I was, so I was really sad when it ended because it was just, it was just beginning to get right, you know? I, I never will forget being on that set and interviewing Linda Evans and John Forsyth and seeing all of this magnificent furniture that was mm. very real. Mm. Those antiques, and I know you're an antique lover, so mm. you must have loved the opulence of all of that. But again, it was enormous hard work. I watched you shoot one day and there were just so many different elements to it. Uh, you, did you leave at the end of the day just exhausted? It was tiring. I mean, the, the most tiring thing is, is having to look good all day. Yes. <laughs> it's exhausting. Well, easy for you, though. Look no, at you. No, I don't think so. Putting on an evening dress at 5.30 in the morning when you get to work, I mean, no, it's that's so peculiar. <laughs> dynasty is what they call it in England. Yes. And now your family must love watching you. Do yes. You? Well, of course, it's finished now. Even even, you know, even in England, yes. Um, but it was great for them because General Hospital they didn't see in England, and it was uh, so it meant a lot more to them when I was doing. Oh, yeah, they must have loved that. Yeah. Um, the closed captioning of some television shows is so wonderful for the hearing impaired. Mm -hmm. I mean, you seem to have so many interests in helping people. You and Marley Matlin, Matlin were just down at, in Washington, weren't you? Yes, we testified at a, uh, a subcommittee uh, hearing. Um, Senator Anaway was the um, uh, chairman of the committee, and we testified trying to encourage the bill to be passed that will man make it mandatory for all televisions over 17 inches to have closed caption capabilities. Wouldn't so that be great? Oh, it would be fantastic because the units that, that the deaf people have to buy cost $200. And that's a lot of money. Yes, uh, it is. A lot of money, especially when you want young children to have the benefits of good television mm -hmm. and then often it's dependent upon their parents to pay for it. And it will encourage, I think, more television shows to be closed captioned. Um, if those capabilities were on all televisions. So you think you'll win this one? Well, we got it passed from the subcommittee to the committee. Now, Good. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> I, said, I said when I was testifying, I said, I cannot say that I'm here testifying as a concerned citizen. I'm actually here testifying as a concerned resident alien. <laughs> so in other they words, laughed. American politics is not quite, I don't really know what's going on. You can't vote, but boy, do you have clout. It doesn't <laughs> matter, as well right? Make the most yeah. of it. Now, you just finished two films. One, yes. in, did you shoot with Cheech in Australia? In, uh, in Australia, but mostly in New Zealand, yes. Oh, and that's such a beautiful it's country. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. And this film is called? It's, it's called A Shrimp on the Barbie. I don't know. I don't know, haven't seen it yet. <laughs> but what does that mean? Because I love Australia and all the... Well, you know the Paul Hogan commercial for Australia, Throw Another Shrimp on the Oh, moment. that's right. That's where it comes from. That's all right. But and you, you did another film with John yes. Candy, right? Yes. This is the one that I'm so excited about. Um, I got to work opposite John Candy, who is so wonderful. I mean, he's obviously, he's very funny, but he's such a sweetheart. Is and he? It's, that's oh, nice the to hear. nicest, nicest man. In fact, he's done 31 movies and he said this was the most wonderful experience he's ever had on a movie. Well, that's nice it, to hear. It was just the nicest atmosphere and the nicest people and the greatest script and it was wonderful. And the name of this film? Delirious. And this, when did this comes out? Soon. Christmas time. Christmas time. Oh, good. Yeah. A Christmas release. That's yes. nice. Yeah. So what's up now? You finished those two projects. Where do you go from here? Well, I've been working on my second career, which is a uh, photographer. 
And as a matter of fact, this week I have two shoots for Architectural Digest. Yeah. This lady has been going around the country photographing, unbeknownst to the gorgeous men in our country, gorgeous men in our country, is yes. that right? Yes, now that where? was a job I had. Yeah. <laughs> well, Find gorgeous men and take so, their Look picture. at Wayne, he's brushing his hair back. Mm. He wants you to look over there at him. You see our lighting director? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Wayne. We'll get you. We'll get you. <laughs> Later. Uh, this is for Revlon? It was for Revlon, yes. I had an exhibition in New York of photographs. Uh, I just They sent me on this wonderful mission of go around the United States and uh, take pictures of good-looking men. It sounds like life is pretty good for you right now, and I'm thrilled to hear that. You are such a lady with such a big heart, and it's nice to meet you, Emma. Thanks for all you do. Thank you.